Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first installment of Tales from the Turan Trade Authority. What is the Turan Trade Authority, you might ask? Well, it was a series of books written in the late 70s by Stuart Cowley. These were meant to be a future history written to accompany pre-existing science fiction paperback covers. These books are now legendary within the science fiction community of a certain age, and they exhibited some of the most wondrous art ever executed within the genre. Art by people like Peter Elson, Tony Roberts, Colin Hay, some of the most brilliant work out there. I first experienced these books through my uncle, who had all of them, and that was a revelation, and I was never the same afterwards. And so I'd like to use this series, hopefully, to communicate that sense of wonder which I got through it, and read some of my favorite um, chapters and episodes of the uh, Terran Trade Authority saga. Um, I'll be starting this series with this episode, which is pulled from Space Wreck, the second book in the series. This was probably my favorite, and it, it seems to be a lot of people's favorites as well. It's a collection of uh, stories about derelicts and ghost ships, and the mysterious circumstances which caused their demise. And that's what was so interesting about this universe. It was very old, and had lots of mysteries scattered throughout it. And now, without further ado, as originally written by Stuart Cowley in Space Wreck, The Series Disaster. By the early 24th century, a number of scientific problems had grown from items of secondary importance to difficulties for which solutions had to be found. They spanned a broad spectrum of research areas from microelectronics to astrophysics, and it was decided to institute a massive scientific program to which all members of the Turan Federation would contribute according to their resources. One field of increasing importance due to the longer journeys colonizer ships were having to make on their way to settle new worlds was the study of artificial food supplies. It fell on the North American state to undertake researches in this area, and they accordingly provided a specially designed research ship, the Ceres, whose task it was to act as a mobile laboratory system complete with a mini solar artificial habitat. This, as the name suggests, was a nuclear fusion reactor which acted as a miniature sun, and was the first of its kind to be small enough to be carried aboard a ship. It was able to provide an environment suitable for the growing of a wide variety of complex plant and animal forms to supplement the usual, rather uninteresting, hydroponic food banks that were the standard source of protein. An important spin-off was the opportunity for the passengers of such vessels to enjoy a reasonable facsimile of the planetary conditions that they had left behind. Ceres became operational in 2318 AD, and over the next few years contributed considerably to the science of in-flight dietetics before she was replaced by yet more sophisticated facilities. She still had an important role to play, however, and was employed to research problems experienced by new colonies trying to introduce their own food chains or combat obstructive indigenous ones. In this capacity, she was posted to the young colony of New Mornak, a solitary planet orbiting a minor star out on the rim. Few settlers opted to go to worlds on the galactic perimeter, but this one promised to yield considerable mineral wealth and was the object of a privately financed expedition. Ceres had been contracted by the settlers themselves to help them with difficulties they were experiencing in the propagation of introduced food plants. All the species tested were being attacked by a native organism which they had failed to isolate. When Ceres arrived, she immediately took up station and started work. Her records show that the technicians aboard were successful in isolating the virus concerned, but what went wrong is still not entirely clear. The reports received by the settlers during the weeks when the ship was orbiting their world indicated that the virus was one which attacked the cells of off-world flora, breaking down their structure in such a way as to prevent water retention. Somehow the osmotic process was inhibited, 
allowing fluids to escape without being replaced. Work started on interfering with the genetic characteristics of the virus itself, but two days after this intention had been declared, the colonists received a cryptic message which simply stated, Accident has occurred. Ship contaminated. Do not. Repeat, do not attempt entry. About an hour later, the message was repeated, followed by a computer transmission detailing a stream of data relating to their work on this project. No information was included, however, about the accident mentioned in the first message. But obviously, a mutated strain of the virus had somehow escaped into the vessel. Shortly after the computer began reading out the data, a maintenance scooter was plotted, leaving Ceres and heading off into space. It now seems likely that the two men aboard decided that they would rather perish swiftly in open space than confined aboard the death ship, as their airlines had been deliberately severed. The problem virus was eventually brought under control due to the work already carried out aboard the Ceres, and she still hangs in space above New Mornak as a memorial to the men who died in her, her silent hull empty and dark except for the gradually fading light from the mini-solar globe.